I recently began playing the Dead Space remake that released about a year ago. It was my first introduction to the game, going in almost completely blind other than viewing a few clips on Twitter and hearing about it through word of mouth. And before I say this, I want to make it very clear that I love this game. It feels and looks amazing, it runs perfectly, it's incredibly fun, there's really nothing wrong with it. But at the same time, I almost felt disappointed by it at first. Not because the game is bad, it's far from it, but because it's really not that scary. Now I acknowledge that that sounds like your douchey friend from junior high who bragged about how his parents let him watch horror films and that they're really not that bad. But I'm being very genuine when I say this. Sure, the opening scene where you're running through narrow, dark corridors with necromorphs being illuminated by the flickering lights of the ship got my heart pumping, and the first few burst out of the vents jump scares would get to me. But after a while, it just became routine. You start to expect it. You know where a monster might jump out at you, and when they inevitably do, you're not that shocked. This isn't a new issue for horror games though, especially ones where you're expected to die. Or you're just not very good at aiming and die a lot anyway. Yeah, I'm going to gasp in shock when something jumps off the ceiling and penetrates its claws through my chest, but after I restart and try again, it becomes more of an obstacle than an actual scare. I face this problem a lot with Dead Space, mostly because I'm not very good at the game, but also because this is just how the gameplay loop works, as it does with many other games in this genre. When I played my first few hours of the game, I enjoyed myself, and weirdly that's not what I wanted. I wanted to be nervous to go into a new room, not excited to see what I could scavenge or what story piece I was going to uncover. I went to bed that night and slept fine, which is great, but that's not the normal experience I get from playing horror games. It was only when I revisited the game the next day that I began to feel unnerved. Dead Space makes you backtrack through areas many times throughout the game, and as I was traversing through these familiar zones, I began to get chills. It was so strange to me. I asked myself, why now? What changed from earlier? Then I started looking up and down the tattered steel walls and across the bloodied floors of every room. I had never noticed them before. It was so much scarier now. I began to look at the necromorphs closer as well, and their models would sicken me. They move in ways that make my skin crawl just thinking about it, a process I couldn't partake in when I had three of them running at me from all sides. I started noticing their footsteps all around me on the ship. It was always in areas that I had cleared out and had no risk of being attacked in. They still made me shrink in my seat when I heard them. Dead Space is not interested in making you jump off your couch in fear. Instead, it thrives off this feeling of discomfort from thinking about what happened in this room before you, what happened in this room with you, and what's going to happen in this room in the future. It's the blood on the walls that raises your heart rate later in the game, not the blood that comes from Isaac himself. Dead Space's necromorphs might seem like the main attraction of this game at first glance, but they're simply the workers inside the haunted house that is the Ishimura. To me, the best horror games are the ones that don't make you scream the loudest or make you pause the game out of fear the most. They're the ones that stick with me. The ones that infect my mind with images of hallways I can't see the end of, staircases that never seem to end, people and places they're not supposed to be. It's the feeling the setting provides me with that will always be the most valuable. Devs know that jump scares are cheap, and that they can only get away with a handful before the player begins to roll their eyes. So instead of throwing the horror at you, they build the horror around you. While Fallout isn't the farthest thing from a horror game, it's definitely not the closest. On the surface, it has its moments. There are certain buildings and zones that aren't the most pleasant to explore, but these moments are typically paced by the player themselves in a way that can break up this tension. This is because tension is never the main focus of these games. The gunplay, story, open world, and roleplaying will always be trying to fight for the front seat. But this is only on the surface. Below it, Fallout games become something completely different. Across the gargantuan maps of these games lie caves and, more importantly, vaults where the fun role-playing game you were playing a moment ago turns into one of the most terrifying experiences of your life. 
In the caves, the walls drip with moisture as you try your best to navigate through the similar looking rooms in order to find something worth diving into this cavern for, or even just to find a way back out. In the vaults, the empty hallways call me back to my childhood, fearing the dark stretches for no other reason than the unknowns that exist in the darkness. They give you the feeling that you, or anyone else, shouldn't be there. The structure of the underground shelters is falling apart, and they're usually infested with enemies who moved in in place of the vault dwellers that previously occupied the space. These factors on their own, however, don't give you the full effect. The true terror sets in when you turn your music off. The Fallout games pride themselves on their retro music, and for good reason. Alongside the technology of the game, the music is what gives Fallout its retro-futuristic feel. It almost feels blasphemous to walk through the wasteland without having some song from the 40s blasting from your wrist. The atmosphere of Fallout's world almost rests entirely in its music's hands, but this overshadows another feature that shifts this worldview entirely. The ambience of the Fallout games is, to put it as simple as I possibly can, petrifying. The clanking of your footsteps on the vault floor, the sound of radioactive water falling from the ceiling and splashing against the caves, the distant echo of mutants through the sealed rooms of the vaults all, with the absence of music, make you feel like the walls are closing in on you, as if everything is so much closer to you than you could ever imagine. This lack of comfort from the music puts the player on the edge of their seats and forces them to stalk through the abandoned shafts of the world with their weapon readied at all times, no matter how little danger they may be in. The scares that come from this tension shouldn't be that bad. They shouldn't make you scream like you've been shot and shake from fear after the encounter with a basic enemy ends but they do. The mere sound of taking damage is enough to make you swing the camera around violently to see what's after you. It's usually just a rad roach. The concept of the vaults themselves is terrifying on their own and becomes even more terrifying when you discover that almost every single one is abandoned. No one should be living in these anymore, and usually no one is. Like everything else in the Fallout universe, the locations are dilapidated, the hallways feel cold and lifeless, and the usual absence of human life within them reinforces this feeling. It's like exploring an abandoned hotel filled with the stories of the people that once stayed here. And it's not like these dungeons are completely absent of the usual Fallout charm. Super mutants will still deliver their silly one-liners, and the combat is still as clunky and a little funny to watch as it is without Big Iron playing in the background. Even the contents of the vaults themselves can be silly, like with Vault 108 in Fallout 3, where the only enemy present in the vault is a cluster of crazed clones. But that silence, man, it still gets to you. And this feeling isn't absent from the surface either. The whipping winds of the wasteland and the sound of crunching dirt under your feet aren't the most pleasant thing to hear, but it's nothing compared to those holes in the ground. Nothing in these games do. You can escape these feelings, however. The Fallout games are huge. You can walk for miles to get away from this if you really want. Hell, you can walk a few miles north of Vault 108 and take part in one of the goofiest missions in the entire series. In other games though, you might not be so lucky. It feels insane to say this, but the feeling that Silent Hill 2 gives you has never been matched in almost 23 years since its release. And while Fallout and Silent Hill couldn't be less similar, the two have something in common. The dread you get from their ambience. The only difference with Silent Hill is that there is no escape. No fun music to throw on when you begin to feel too tense. The only sound you really get is the wails from the monsters and the static from the broken radio James carries with him, interrupted briefly by the simplistic, barren score. You can't run off to a different side of the map to avoid being terrified. Every corner you turn gives you something to be afraid of. And even if you wanted to get away within the confines of a level by hiding in a room or a closet, most of the time the lock to the door is broken. You're trapped. And the only solution is to endure the dread. But what underscores all of this and is the sole reason you feel your heart in your throat from the moment you turn this game on to the moment you turn it off 
is the silence. I think Blake Hester of Game Informer put it perfectly in a recent article he wrote. Within the silence, I started to become my own worst enemy. James's footsteps sounded like anvils falling on the wooden floor. I imagined he was walking too loudly, that someone would hear him and come after us, a mechanic that does not actually exist in the game. Silent Hill 2 is made to be terrifying and nothing else. Everything from the enemies to the dense fog to the eerie characters you meet and their outlandish actions are enough to bring even the most seasoned horror game player to their knees. You see cutscenes that make your jaw drop, monsters who are not anatomically possible, and yet, among all of this, it's the noise, or the lack thereof, that gets to you first. The silence is deadpan, the footsteps and grunts of James being the only thing to cut through it. That is until you encounter an enemy. Here, the broken radio I previously mentioned will buzz uncontrollably. It's a sound that makes you want to rip your headphones off, and while it doesn't scare you, it's enough to make you uncomfortable, to unease you into running up to the monster as fast as you can, not because it poses any serious threat, but just to make the noise stop. And yeah, you can turn the radio off, of course, but then you don't get the benefit of knowing when the monster in front of you is dead when the static subsides. Once all the chaos settles, all the empty radio waves clear out, and the few enemies that line the grimy halls are killed off, you're left alone again, and you're reminded of the silence, and you begin to hear your footsteps more clearly, and in real life, your heart beating out of your chest. It's almost like you want the monsters to come back, just so you're not alone. Or at least, you're certain you're not alone. And even when it's not quiet, the game doesn't exactly fill the empty space with sounds you're excited to hear. The score to Silent Hill 2 is bare bones, complete with eerie looping synths or the swirling of wind with the sound of seemingly stomps in the background. When you're playing, it almost goes unnoticed. Most of the time, you're not even treated to the ambient tracks unless you're roaming the streets. But when you pause for a moment to think or reconvene, it sneaks up on you, reminding you of what you're playing. The tension is leaning heavily on the ambience of this game, but Silent Hill 2 isn't immune to the jump scare either. But it almost feels like it earns it, like the game is restraining itself from having something, anything, jump out at you from around the corner. Instead, they save these for when they matter the most, such as a scream in the apartments at the beginning of the game that redirect you to a major set piece or pyramid head teleporting in front of you in the hospital to knock you down to a previously inaccessible area. Sometimes they just want to f*** with you though. You mother f Walking through the bare halls of Silent Hill and navigating the vaults of Fallout shouldn't give me the same feeling. Fallout isn't interested in scaring you, it has other preoccupations. Most people remember these games for their missions or silly dialogue, not random spots on the map buried in the middle of nowhere. Silent Hill, on the other hand, can only be remembered for this. In both situations though, whether intentional or not, I found myself terrified. I looked over my shoulder in one game just as much as I did the other, and I wouldn't be doing this if not for the silence. Silent Hill 2 could get by simply on its sound design. Nevertheless, it insists on making you want to cry by bombarding all of your senses. There's something wrong with this town, and Konami made sure that you were going to see that. When you first arrive in Silent Hill, you have to cope with the disorienting fog and wade through dingy woods to get to the city center. The streets are lined with humanoid figures and you can't see more than a few meters in front of you. The first level, the apartment building, is brutal. The halls feel tight tighter than they should be. The floors are patched and the walls look like they're decaying, as though the building is rotting from the inside out. It most likely is. Strange features make up small parts of the space. Metal bars block James from the other side of the building, there's a baby carriage sitting in the middle of an empty swimming pool, and small holes for the player to stick their hand blindly into, just being a few examples of the weirdest parts of the area. For the most part, however, it feels fairly normal. 
I mean, the building makes sense. If you look at it from a certain perspective, it's not much different than your average abandoned building. But from here, things only get worse. The next level of the hospital starts off the same. Abandoned, decaying, but still not completely out of the ordinary. Then you fall through the ceiling and suddenly rooms are wrapped in plastic that weren't before and doors that were previously unaccessible are unlocked. The hospital changes completely. And it's not just the hospital that's different. The world changes as well when you exit the building. The roads that were previously shrouded in fog now obscure your vision with darkness instead. Giant walls block roads that you previously walked down, and the roads themselves are beginning to fragment, opening up to the abyss. As you progress in the game, the world shifts. It feels like Silent Hill is transforming. The moment you begin to adapt to your surroundings, you're thrown through an unexpected loop, disorienting you and draining the color from your face when you realize that you have to rediscover what lies beyond your clouded perspective. On top of this, there's many parts of the game that just don't make sense. After climbing down a series of seemingly endless stairs, you dive down a hole in the historical society and then land in a well that seems to have no exit. When you find this hidden door, it leads you to a maze of sewers with a room the game traps you in, with the key to exiting being a random code you have to guess before the bugs that fill the room kill you. When you eventually get out, you'll fall down another hole into a prison, complete with an enormous empty courtyard with one stone shrine in the middle. Keep in mind, you're supposed to be miles underground at this point. It's from here that you just continue to spiral, jumping down holes and experiencing horrors that would take hours to explain. Rooms with walls made of flesh, a circular hallway with a chain link floor, pyramid head chases you around in, a meat locker filled with bodies, and a graveyard complete with a headstone with James's name on it are just a few of the unexplainable terrors you experience in the underground of Silent Hill 2. After you persevere through all of this, it spits you out at a lake. It doesn't make sense. You fell down hole after hole that looked like they had no bottom, just to be a few feet below the surface the entire time. You look back at the door you walked out of and question if anything you just experienced was real. It feels like the game is messing with you, and it has been the whole time. The term disreality defines a state of being unlike what is real or actual. It's a word that almost perfectly describes Silent Hill 2, a game where people die and come back to life, where the main threat is a man wearing a triangle on his head, where you can walk into one room and walk out moments later just for everything to be different. You can never be sure what's happening around you is real. You can never know that everything will be the way you left it when you come back to this area later. There's nothing you can do about it either. No special choice that will turn the lights on and make people act normal. It's this unpredictability that makes you nervous and, in the wake of this confusion, the game makes you vulnerable. Silent Hill 2 makes you feel like you missed something, as if you skipped an important cutscene that gives you a clue to a puzzle or found a new speedrunning time save that completely cuts out an entire part of the story. But that's all on purpose. This game is meant to confuse you. You're supposed to question everything you've been told and what you know about this world. The monsters might be unsettling, but the real agony comes from the fear of something not being quite right when you walk out of the door you came in. And the thing is, you're never really under any serious threat. Boss fights are a breeze, ammo is bountiful, the enemies act like they almost want to be put down. Probably because they do. But despite this, you still feel like you want to get out and feel understanding of the world you're in again. And I can't blame you. Silent Hill 2 still gives you comfort in its own sadistic way though. As confusing as it might be, it still gives you an amazing story to follow, cutscenes that allow you to put down your controller, and characters to latch onto. Other games lack this quality. Exit 8 is an indie game that released recently on November 29th of 2023. The premise is simple, walk through an underground tunnel until you find the 8th exit. It's only when you walk past the first turn that you notice that everything is exactly the same. 
At first glance, you might think that it's just the developers being lazy, as if they didn't want to take the time to create different environments for every part of the subway. But this couldn't be more intentional. The game only has four rules. Don't overlook any anomalies. If you find an anomaly, turn back immediately. If you don't find any anomalies, don't turn back and you can only leave through exit 8. Everything about this game is so stripped down, there's nothing about it that should be outwardly scary. And yet, I found myself checking over my shoulder after every turn. When I would notice something off, I would sprint the other way as fast as the game would allow me to. There would be a click in the ceiling that would make me twitch every single time it went off. Exit 8's method of frightening you is different than all the previous games I've mentioned, because Exit 8 has a baseline of normalcy. You walk through this station so many times, you know exactly what it should look and sound like. I spent so much time studying the man that you walk by every time that when he had an ear-to-ear -ear grin or looked a little bit taller than usual, it was daunting. Not to mention the changes to the tunnel itself. When the lights go out or the doors on your right swing open, I had to restrain myself from running from my computer in real life. But how does this game do this? It's not like it's jumping out at you usually. The developers easily could have had an enemy fall from the ceiling and chase you back the way you came. They could have had the man that walks past you turn around and follow your every move. Hell, they could have put a guy around the final corner of the hall that jumps out at you and yells boo, and that would have got me. Instead of this, they don't really do anything. And it's still scary. There's some anomalies that are more noticeable than others, but the ones that keep you in the game for as long as possible are the ones that you might not ever notice. All it takes is a simple doorknob not being in the right place or a slight shadow on the ceiling to bring you back to square one. Exit 8 makes you question everything you see. I thought everything was an anomaly. I scanned the posters vigorously every time, trying to find even the smallest difference. I would observe the walking man as closely as I possibly could. What hand was he holding his briefcase in? Was his face off? Was he walking differently than usual? I even began to pay attention to the sounds, from the clicking of the halls to the sound of my own feet on the ground. I would spend minutes in one section trying so hard to notice something wrong all to turn the corner and see the dreaded zero on the yellow poster. I started to question my own judgment, sometimes turning around even if I didn't notice anything outwardly wrong. It was in these moments that I left myself the most vulnerable. I would be so focused on my checklist of the room that when I heard a slight bang on the doors, I lost it. Exit 8 doesn't try that hard to scare you. It doesn't have to. Though liminal, its setting is normal enough for a slight change to leave you paralyzed in fear. It makes you dread having to turn through its endless corners and loathe the mere thought of the hall you're in being right. Because, if it's not, you know you have to go through this all over again 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 I still remember the layout of my childhood home like the back of my hand. That floor plan is ingrained into my mind, and I don't think it's ever going to leave. I remember everything about that house in fact. The ugly wallpaper in my parents' room when we first moved in, the red trim around the outside of the house, even the cobweb-infested shed on the underside of the back porch. The thing I remember the most, however, is the long, narrow hallway my room was in and how scared of it I was at night. I can recall waking up in the middle of the night, whether it was because I was sick, scared, couldn't sleep, and having an intense desire to run to my parents' room about 10 steps away. At this time, the house was always dead, and my memory of this place I spent the majority of my life in was useless, because when every light was out, the hallway was suddenly foreign to me. I'm not sure what I was scared of. I didn't have a fear of ghosts or monsters. The dark didn't really bother me either. I think my fear came more from the fact that I was alone in this place that, a few hours prior, looked completely different. There was obviously nothing to be scared of. No monster hiding in the dark. I made this fear up in my head. To me though, 
There was nothing as real in the world as the pit that I got in my stomach when I looked down that hall. Anatomy by Kitty Horror Show takes this feeling and transforms it into a tangible experience and, with that, takes all these elements that I mentioned previously and ties them together better than any AAA game ever has. The game drops you into a dark, empty home. The layout is simple, making it impossible for you to get lost. And while you may think this would be a point of comfort, it serves as the opposite. This house is cold, it lacks any semblance of character. There's no decor. The pictures hung on the wall that would usually be filled with photos of family or cheap artwork are instead used to display diagrams of ticks and skulls. The house is clean, but even if somebody was there keeping it tidy, they weren't there anymore. You're all alone, wandering through the dark house. When you eventually stumble into the kitchen, you see a cassette tape and a player on the table next to it. The story of the game lies entirely in these tapes. Collecting them is the game itself. Anatomy has no score. It hardly even has sound effects. The only things to break the quiet, whirring ambience in the background is the sound of doors opening and the unbearable buzz of the tapes. It's through this scratchy audio that you're lectured about the house. The speaker compares the house to a body, tells the player a story of a home invasion, and berates you for not doing as you're supposed to. And then the audio clicks, and you return the silence. Anatomy is telling you what to be afraid of. It's creating these narratives in your head and then leaving that thought to fester as the quiet eats you alive. You're told the basement is horrifying, then the bedroom. When the narrator began telling the story of a man breaking into a house, I started to get paranoid. I peeked around the corner as they told me how he moved through the entryway and down the main hallway, expecting to see him striding toward me. The man never came though. There's no one else alive in here other than you and the house itself. And yes, the house is alive. If it's not made obvious by the veins and flesh, it's presented through the doors that swing open by themselves and the ones that unlock when they're ready for you. Rooms can swallow you whole, as the narrator relates the bedroom to the mouth. The game itself has a mind of its own too, turning off on its own and making you reload and start from the beginning, this time with a slightly different house and new tapes. With every restart, rooms begin to change and things get weirder and weirder. Items start floating and pictures change as well. The comfort that you got from knowing the layout of the house if it was ever there before, is completely gone now. The previous titles made me question myself, but Anatomy consumed me. It's a game that pulled me in more than any game I had ever played before, leaving me wanting more after every restart. And while the latter half of the game is still intriguing, it's those first 20 minutes before the house becomes unrecognizable that scared me the most. The moments when the house reminds me the most of those nights of me being too scared to run across the hall to my parents' room. I know these walls. I know this feeling. I've been here before. And nothing is scarier than returning to that. It admittedly feels a bit silly to be scared of all these things. It almost makes me feel like a coward to admit that sounds or the lack thereof, frightened me that the spillage of virtual blood and the bodies of zombified people are what scared me the most in Dead Space. The fact that I screamed louder than I ever had because two identical figures looked at me in a weird way. In the end though, I found all these experiences to be the most valuable ones a horror game can give you. These worlds were manufactured to make them feel this way. Hours were spent designing these settings to make them have this aesthetic. Manufactured, however, doesn't mean they lack real fear. It just means that they don't have to shove it in your face. Instead, they build it all around you, from the iron walls that feel like they're ready to collapse in a game that was never meant to be horror in the first place, to the dark ones in a game that could never be perceived as anything else. The jump scare was never absent from these games, I jumped plenty of times while playing them. But that was never the main focus, there was never a big scare that had to be building up the entire time. In the beginning, I said that Dead Space had disappointed me. In reality, all it did was surprise me. 
both in the game when the Necromorphs jumped out of the ventilation, but also in its maturity, its ability to take a different route, one that stops itself from using cheap scares every chance it gets and, instead, allowing the atmosphere to do the heavy lifting. It's easy to make someone jump, it really takes no effort at all. To give someone fear that sticks with them forever, to remind them of their deepest childhood fears or give them new ones as an adult, that's what's difficult.